Okay, let us turn to Matthew 1:21. Also go to Philippians chapter 2 verse 6. Our God is holy. Our God is holy. Our God is holy. Our God is holy. Our God is holy because his nature is holy. So again, when we say nature, um, we think of our nature, human nature, as the genetic makeup. And this is exclusive to humans as well as everything else in the universe. The creator does not have, God does not have genetic uh, makeup or genes per se. But for the sake of argument, for easiness of understanding, um, sort of that quote-unquote genetic makeup of God. What, is, what makes him God? It's his holiness. That's what I mean when I, when I say he, his holiness is, his nature is his holiness. His nature is holy. So everything about him is holy. Therefore, all that come from him are holy. His word, his son, the Holy Spirit, and his name. They're all holy. And to those who know his holiness, he finally reveals himself. So that's what faith is, to believe uh, by knowing his holiness and acknowledging that he is holy. Um, and our faith life then is about lifting him up because he is holy. Because there is no one like him, we have to lift him up. We have to lift him up for who he is, what he has done, and for his name. For his name is no, like no other. We lift him up like no other. Amen? So when we lift him up, we lift him up. The way we lift him up has to also reflect who he is, that he is like no other. Because I'm going to define the word holy or holiness. The fact that he is holy tells us he's like no other. The word holy in Hebrew is kadosh, and that meaning is to be set apart. Whatever you may imagine as holy is not it. Because people tend to think holy is being quiet and like, like walking into a cathedral. That's holy, right? Um, people who look certain way, uh, they're holy, or they act like they're holy, right? So we have our own version. People have their own understanding or you know, imagination of what holiness is. But it's simply it's to be set apart from others because it is entirely different. So it is the most excellent thing or the person is the most excellent person or being. In other words, outstanding. You know the word outstanding. You know, during your mar marking period when you get your report cards, you look at the ranking, right? One, two, five. Five is what? Outstanding. All right, so you look for the five. We, we are so not interested in Aaron's performance that the school wrote us a letter. We found, Mr. and Mrs. Jung, we found that you have not checked your daughter's uh, report card online, so we suggest that you go in and log in and let us know if you have any problems. So it's like, oops. <laughs> so, usually, you know, parents are like, what did you get? What did you get? But we're like, let the time go by. And then the principal get, sends us a letter. We noticed that you did not log on to find. Is there anything wrong with your Okay, so we look at it. And then when we do open out, then we want to know what the numbering is about. And usually one is, you know, under whatever standard. And then five is outstanding. Um, but um, I'm not going to tell you what she got. <laughs> um, but five is this unusual, you know, standing performance. So you like to hear the word outstanding because it stands out. The person stands out for their performance, whether as an academic person or in academia or in, uh, in the athletics. So somebody is a super, athlete, uh, a super athlete, he uh, or she is an outstanding uh, performer, right? Uh, again, in athletics or in the arts, whatever it is, uh, people pursue uh, this dream of becoming the outstanding. So outstanding means to be like no other. They're the one. They're the one and then there's the rest, right? So, so that's sort of our sort of street term for understanding holiness. So the Bible then tells us that his name, the name of the Lord God is holy. God's name is holy which means that his name is like no other. It is above all other names. Above every name is the name of God. How many of you believe that? Amen? Amen? Well, name 
uh, is then directly connected to honor, one's honor and pride. Um, so men and women are called to serve for the honor of the nation uh, when there is a war. And when they're called, they go out, uh, even if the day before they joined the military, they lived as someone's son or husband or father, but the moment they put the uniform on and then they join the military, then their duty and the goal, the effort of their life is then for one purpose. That's to uh, fight for the honor of the nation. So they do it honorably and they do it to death. Because there is the promise by the nation or the kingdom that even if they perish in the process of fighting for the honor of the nation, that their sacrifice will not be in vain, but rather be remembered for generations to come. So they are not afraid to go and throw their life um, away for the purpose of the honor of nation. So they fight for the honor of nation. You can call it uh, for political uh, purpose today, but the reason why, uh, for example, the United States get involved in all these other foreign affairs, you know, uh, or uh, warfares in other places, yeah, the U.S. is interested for its own sake, but namely to keep its power as the superpower nation. And for its honor and glory, it gets involved and intervenes uh, into these other um, uh, country or national matters. So yes, it's, it becomes a political problem, but it's all for the sake of its name. So it's an interesting thing. Name is something that you can't, it, it's an ab abstract thing, uh, but yet, with the name, there's so much um, interest and so much, uh, so much of your effort and your passion is involved. So if anyone insults your name, uh, it's as painful or even more painful than someone wants to throw a punch on your, at your face, right? So if you think about it, like the face is also part of your pride. So if someone was to spit on your face, not not when it's by accident, they're laughing and then they spit <laughs> across the table, which I have witnessed one time and it was not pretty at all. When the piece of food landed in their mouth, yeah, that's <laughs> sharing love with your brothers. That's, I saw that, that's disgusting. But uh, when somebody is, is mad at someone and wants to insult them and they, they spit at their face, this is a great insult. I mean, it's even worse than someone slapping your face. So there's something about the face that when you get attacked in the face, we take it so personally rather than someone stepping on our foot, right? So it, it's, it's better if someone elbowed your side and, and broke your ribs than somebody spitting on your face. It's, it's interesting, right? Because your face is sort of your honor. On top of that, if someone were to say behind your back something about you, your name and something bad associated with your name, that hurts more than anything else then. Right. So um, celebrities do, would do anything. They make all that money to pay their lawyers to fight, to reclaim their um, you know, status or fame. And nowadays with social media, anybody can say whatever about whoever. Um, so libel is an issue, but they want to protect their name, celebrities, because it's all about their name. And anybody insulting their name and saying something that is not right about their name uh, I, I hear that some places like Russia, they have such strict rule about, rules about that, that you can go to jail by insulting some famous person with inaccurate information. But isn't that what the National Enquirer is about? I mean, there won't be any paper called National Enquirer if there were no lies. I mean, Elvis is alive. I mean, how, how many times are you going to read about that in a supermarket? I always look at it because it's right there. It's, you have to, and I tell Aaron, close your eyes. Don't look at it. But anyway, so it's just like, he's a man. I mean, there's all those things that are out there. But, um, but in other countries and other settings, that could be legal, right? Um, so name and honor is so closely associated that whether it's on the scale of nation or personal, people put every effort to make their name become well known and even above others. So this is why star athletes work very hard to break so-called the record, right? So the uh, Olympians and um, Michael Phelps, even after he gets arrested third time drunk driving, he's gonna go and compete in the next Olympics. So then the fans can be really excited and watch him swim because he wants to continue to put his name up there because his name has been defamed and it's been a shame by his wrongdoings, but now he needs to reclaim by winning more gold, right? So people fight endlessly for uh, their name to stand above others. This is human nature, and it's the nature that God instilled in us. 
he instilled in us so that we can have some idea of how great his name is and the kind of honor that God has for his name. Therefore, we should also honor him uh, the way that he deserves, his name deserves. So the Bible shows a record of how different his name is. The holiness of his name, the holiness of the name of God is recorded throughout the history of the Bible. That's what this book is about. And the way it begins is God making man in the image of God. From the dust of the ground, God makes his body, but inside of him, God breathes his breath, uh, the breath of life, and the man then becomes, a, becomes what's called the living being. And this living being lives in the Garden of Eden, where he is to, for the flesh, whatever he wants, the fruits and the vegetables, but for his spirit inside his flesh, he is to eat the word of God. The word of God came to him as command. Do not eat from this one tree called the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Because if you eat of it, what happens? You will surely die. What will die? Which part of the man will die? The flesh or the spirit? Spirit. Wow, Brandon, did you just say spirit? I thought I saw. Okay, that's good. Wow. How many weeks has it been? All right, good. So this, <laughs> so far, all right, the, the youngest one in the room. The spirit has to eat the word of God. But the reason why God gave this word, yes, it was for the spirit to live, but also to remind the man, you're not God. You're not God. You do not have the honor of God. You do not have the name of God. You are not holy like God. That's why you need to listen. But in Genesis chapter 3, we see a serpent coming to the woman who comes from the man and deceives her to be like God by taking the forbidden fruit. He said, you will not surely die, woman, but you will be like God. That's why God doesn't want you to eat that fruit. And that's when she was tempted and ate this fruit and gave to Adam. And with the same motive to be like God, he takes the fruit. Certainly, he does not become like God. Instead, what, what we find is that sin enters the spirit of the man, Adam. Right? So sin enters his spirit, Adam. And therefore, sin enters all men. Romans 5, 12, also in Corinthians 15, 22, it says that. Through one man comes sin, and therefore the price of sin to all men, which is what? Death. death. What's the price of sin? Death. What kind of death? The death of the spirit. So all men inherit the, inherited the sin, the sin of wanting to be like God that Adam committed. But why was it that Adam wanted to be like God? Who was this serpent? Let's go to Isaiah 14, for those of you who are here for the first time. Isaiah 14, chapter 14, verse 12. How you have fallen from heaven, O morning star, son of the dawn. You have been cast down to the earth, who once laid low the nations. You said in your heart, I will ascend to heaven. I will raise my throne above the stars of God. I will sit enthroned on the mount of assembly, on the utmost heights of the sacred mountain. I will ascend above the tops of the clouds. I will make myself like the most high. But you are brought down to the grave, to the depths of the pit. So here, um, this passage, it, it says, you know, on the one hand, it looks like it's referring to a man who was king of Tyre. But when you look at the entire Bible, the flow of the Bible, we understand that this passage is not referring to a man, but it's referring to who used to be an archangel. So this being was made as an archangel in heaven to glorify his name, right? Because God, before he made the world, he made heaven outside this world, the universe. And in that place, he filled with uh, his glory, his name, his throne. And for his name to be glorious, he made angels. So what is the job description of an angel? Is to glorify the name of God. That's his job description. And the archangel, there was one archangel, there were many, but there was one archangel who was given this one job, which was to worship his name, to glorify his name. And because of his beauty and his talent, uh, Ezekiel 28 also describes that, he becomes proud. And instead of worshiping God and glorifying his name, what he ends up doing is he says, I will ascend my throne. I will raise my throne above the stars of God. I will sit on the throne of the Most High. I will be like God, he said to himself. Now remember, this is a creature like us. And he's challenging the creator God right here. 
And that's why God threw him out of the spiritual heaven and threw him in, into the space called the grave, the depths of the pit. In Hebrew, it's called Sheol, but in Greek, it's called Ho Hades or Hades. And that Hades is referring to the whole world, the universe. So this angel, so-called a fallen angel or fallen angels, they were thrown into the universe where we are right now. So that's why Adam was deceived to be like God, like this angel deceived himself. And the same mo with the same motive, he sinned against God. However, God had the plan. Even though uh, Adam was cast out of the garden and sin and death reigned over all men and curse come as a result of sin, God begins his work of revealing his, himself, specifically his name. God revealed himself uh, through his name, and he began that work by calling on Moses. Now, if you remember Moses, he was a Hebrew by birth, but he was raised as a prince of which country? The prince of Egypt. He was raised by a princess. But because one day he goes out and he sees the Hebrews, his fellow people who are slaves of the Pharaoh, being mistreated by an Egyptian official, he kills the, official, uh, the Egyptian official, and, and, and some, they, he's found, so he runs. And he lives on the desert for 40 years, and by that time, he's 80 years old. And at the age of 80, God called him. Now, the way God called him, how did God call him? Where did God call him from? From the church? From the temple? He was in the desert, and from the burning bush, a burning bush, God called him. So let's go to Exodus chapter 2. There the angel of the Lord appeared to him in flames of fire from within a bush. Moses saw that through the bush, though the bush was on fire, it did not burn up. So Moses thought, I will go over and see the strange sight, why the bush does not burn up. When the Lord saw that he had gone over to look, God called to him from within the bush, Moses, Moses. And Moses said, here I am. So can you imagine the sight? Moses had run away. He becomes a fugitive. And now it's a long gone past that he was a prince of Egypt. And he's living in the desert. He's married. He has children. He's old. And he's tending sheep. And then suddenly he sees a bush burning. Now what, when something burns, you wait for a few minutes and you look at it. You can see things crumbling and sort of turning into ashes, just being consumed. But what he finds with this bush is that that it's not being consumed. It's just burning bright, probably bright red or whatever, and it's in flames, uh, and the, the bush is just stays the same. So he says, I'm going to go over there and look what's going on. And he is just so mesmerized and captivated by the scene, which in the verse 2 it says, the angel of the Lord appeared to him. Who appeared to him? Yeah. Okay, in verse 4, then who saw him coming to the bush? The Lord. The angel of the Lord, it says, and then the Lord. And then what else does it say? The Lord said that he had gone, he saw that he had gone over to look. And then who called him, Moses? Who was it? God. So wait a minute. So there's the angel of the Lord. There's the Lord. Whoa, it's a party. There's a lot of people there, right? So it's, there's God. There's the angel of the Lord. There's Lord, who are they? Who are these people? Me and myself and I. Oh, my goodness. So what's going on? The angel of the Lord appeared to Moses from the bush. So this is the angel of the Lord, meaning the angel who comes in the name of the Lord. I need it up a little bit. Angel of the Lord comes, but he is also called the Lord. And he's also called what? God. Can we say those three things? The angel of the Lord, the Lord... God. What are the three things again? The angel of the Lord, the Lord. Remember that. This is very important. Remember that. Because in the Old Testament, wherever there's mention of the Lord or the Lord God, speaking, appearing even before men, this is not God himself. But specifically, it is the angel of the Lord. The angel sent in the name of the Lord. The angel who works in the name of the Lord appeared from the bush and spoke to Moses by calling him Moses, Moses. And then Moses said, here I am. So he's like really afraid. So let's go to verse 13 and see what he says. Verse 13 to 15. Moses said to God, suppose I go to the Israelites and say to them, the God of your fathers has sent 
me to you. And they asked me, what is his name? Then what shall I tell them? God said to Moses, I am who I am. This is what you are to say to the Israelites. I am has sent me to you. God also said to Moses, say to the Israelites, the Lord, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob has sent me to you. This is my name forever. The name you shall call me from generation to generation. So what you just read from uh, verse 4 on be, until 13, this conversation between God and Moses. And God is saying, Moses, I'm sending you out to bring my people out. Why did he need to bring the people out? What were they doing? They were, they were in slavery in Egypt for how many generations? Four. So it's since, a, um, since Jacob and his family go in, because Joseph was there, without repeating that whole story, they settle there and they become slaves under uh, the Pharaoh. And this is when God then says, Moses, I'm sending you out it, uh, to uh, Egypt to bring them uh, out of uh, their slavery. Then Moses hearing, all, you, can, you can imagine from the burning bush, he is just so shocked and this is just unbelievable. And then he's like, has this mission. What? Where am I going? What? And then what do I tell them? Who sent me? Because he, he's going in as an ambassador, like a messenger. And then the Pharaoh's going to say, so who are you, man? Who are you, old man? Who sent you? Who sent you? So Moses kind of sort of thinking ahead. So who do I tell him has sent me? And what did God say to Moses? So Moses said, what is your name, sir? And he said, I am who I am. So his name is? What kind of name is that? I am. Yeah, I am. So he says, I am has sent you. Usually it's uh, I am John or I am Mary. Now, there are a lot of oppositions here today. What do you think? because I'm going to talk about the name Yeshua. Amen. So we all need to focus and pray as you listen that the Holy Spirit dominates this place and all enemies be gone. Amen. Amen. Something always happens when we try to preach about the name Yeshua. There's always something going on, but we shall prevail. Hallelujah. Amen. So I am, has said, usually we say, I am Joe. I am Joe Kim. I am Bob. I am this and this and that. I am, right? But here is God saying, I am who I am. And no one else is I am. Who else is called I am? No one. So what kind of name is I am? If you look at the scripture, I am, A-M, is cap, they are capitalized. I am, they're all capitalized. So where do they come from, these letters? They come from what's called the tetragrammaton, which is a four-letter name, which are uh, Y-H-W-H. So this is from the Hebrew uh, text. So Y-H-W-H. Sounds like a radio station, but it is the, 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 the to me, that's how I hear it. Like, what kind of a station is that? Y-H-W-H. So this is how they translate it from, um, uh, from the text. And this is the name of God that the Jews believe that God revealed from the burning bush to Moses. So when God said, I am, this I am comes from YHWH. So what does that mean? So YHWH, at some point in their history, the Jews, the Jewish scholars put the vowel points from Adonai and Elohim. Adonai is, means um, Lord, and Elohim means God. So from there, they took the vowel points and added to YHWH, and then they came up with the name Yehovah. Can we say it together? Yehovah. Wow, you speak a Hebrew name. Yehovah. But Yehovah uh, then becomes, what does it sound like? Jehovah or Yahweh. So those are the names. Uh, that's the name of the God of Israel. What was the name of God of Israel in the Old Testament? Jehovah. Let's just agree on Jehovah. Jehovah. But also Yahweh. It's the same thing. Jehovah or Yahweh. So when God said, I am who I am, he was saying, I am like no other. It means I am the creator. Jehovah, Yahweh means the creator, the uncreated one. Everyone else is created, but this one creator stands out above all else because he is the only uncreated. He is the only creator. So this was the name of God manifested by whom? By whom? Who spoke to Moses from the burning bush? Who? 
the angel of the Lord. So the angel of the Lord gave this name to Moses, and then Moses brought it to Egypt and revealed it to Mo uh, the Pharaoh and the people and said, the God of Abraham, of Isaac, and Jacob has sent me, and his name is... Yahweh, his name is Jehovah, and this is the name to be called from generation to generation. However, in Exodus chapter 20, verse 7, after Moses did bring them out, after the ten plagues, after all that saga, they leave Egypt, and they go through the Red Sea, enter the, uh, the desert, and in the desert, they are given the ten commandments, the law of Moses, and along with the other regulations too. But, it, very importantly, in Exodus 20, verse 7, God tells them, You shall not misuse the name of the Lord your God, for the Lord will not hold anyone guiltless who misuses his name. So, meanwhile, God reveals his name to the people, and the people consider this, this great, the greatest honor, because the people of Israel believe that God chose no other people but the people of Israel. Therefore, they are the holy people of God. What kind of people? The holy people of God. And God revealed his name to no other people, but the people of Israel, the holy people of God. So they took it as the greatest honor to be above all other peoples, to know the name of God, the holy name of God. Yet, God said, anyone who misuses my name, I will not hold him guiltless which means I will curse him, I will punish him, I will kill him. <gasps> oh, my Lord. Because even though they took it greatest honor and they also love the name of the Lord God, they fear the name of the Lord God. Because if you mess with his name, you say it wrong and you say, you know how people say, I, one of the things I, I get very upset about people say, oh, Jesus. You people say that, right? So it's when they say, oh, Jesus. They're not praising Jesus. They're, you know, they're cursing Jesus. Yeah. So as Christian, I, I have this, you know, this, this negative reaction. What an insult. They're giving the name Jesus. So it's like that if they were to say, oh, Jehovah, then they would be struck down. This is the, how they considered it, right? This would be the greatest curse. They, they would commit sin against the name. So because of it, they hardly call the name Yahweh. They hardly said the name Yahweh. Even to this day, when they sing of his name, they just usually say Adonai or Elohim. They will say, praise the Lord, praise Adonai, or praise Elohim, God. Because they don't want to even get any close to the chance of insulting the name of God. Because anyone who would insult the name of God would be cursed for generations, and this would be their punishment. So when God uh, commanded um, the King Solomon to build a, uh, the temple of Jerusalem in 1 Kings chapter 8, he said, build the temple for me so that my name might be there. For what, to be in the, for, for what did God tell him to build the temple? For his name to be there. So for his name to be in the house of God, Solomon built the house of God called the temple of Jerusalem. So the ark was inside the most holy place, the ark that was made in the desert by Moses and the people in the desert in Exodus 25, also was in, the same ark was inside this new building called the Temple of Jerusalem. And they believed that the name of God was there. Now, did anyone see this ark? Hey, pay attention. Did anyone see the ark? No. Did anyone see the most holy place? Nobody saw the ark, nobody saw the most holy place. Not even the holy place regular people got to see. It was just the priests who would serve God inside. And it was just the high priest who would go in the most holy place once a year. So really, the name of God was very, very hidden from the people. Even though they were called by his name, they were to honor his name, they were to know his name, they were really, really far away from the name of God. Right? So... On the floor level, it was hidden inside room by room, a carton behind curtain, inside the ark in the dark, but nobody saw. But from the top, also the tabernacle and the temple had coverings, fabrics covering this, uh, this space so that from the bottom and the top, you see that it's just tucked away and hidden away, far away from people, and they're not even to haphazardly, carelessly use it in their day-to-day -day life. So the name of God was so far and so feared for 
Yet the people of Israel took it as an honor because nobody else even knew the name of the Lord God. So the temple was very important to them. And meanwhile, there was the prophecy saying in Psalm 20, 22, 22, I will declare your name to my people. In the assembly, I will praise you. So the name that was hidden away from the people, now there will come a day when his name will be declared and be shouted from the rooftops and be praised among all the people. Who was going to fulfill this prophecy? His name is Yeshua. So when, let's go back to uh, Matthew 121. Go back to 121. Matthew 121. She will give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus because he will save his people from their sins. If you have a footnote there in Jesus and you go down there, what does it say? It, the name is Joshua. The name is Joshua. So the name Jesus that we call it in English is, in jo is Joshua. Joshua, you remember Joshua, right, from the Old Testament. So that name Joshua has the same name, same meaning as Jesus, and it means the Lord saves. So exactly what the angel said, that she will give him a name, and the name Jesus will be given to him because his name means he will save his people from their sins. Remember, the Hebrew names are meaningful, right? So the, the person actually lives that life. Like Jacob was to grasp, and he grasped his brother's heel when he came out as a twin baby. And then all his life he grasped wealth and, and blessings. And in the end he grasped the angel, and he was blessed. So that name really talks about the fate of the person in the Hebrew uh, context. So the name Jesus, even though we read it in English, Jesus, really it, it is the same name as Joshua or Yehoshua. Yehoshua in Hebrew, and that is condensed to be Yeshua. That's why here, if you're joining us for the first time today, you're, you're overwhelmed with all the noise and everything. But on top of it, what is this name Yeshua? So I try to put it in there every time I talk about Yeshua. Also Jesus, but Yeshua is the Hebrew name or the Aramaic name, which means what? The Lord will save. The Lord will save. So his name means the Savior. So when you say Yeshua, it means he, you're saying he is the Savior. So the Savior then is born, and then he walks by the temple of Jerusalem, where which name was? The name Jehovah was. And what did he say about that temple? Destroy this temple, and I will raise it again in three days, John 2.19. So the Jews who worship the name Jehovah, how did they react? Not good. It was not good. This was not good. It was not going to go well because they were very upset. Because remember, anyone who insults the name of the Lord God, anyone who misuses, will not be guiltless. So that when Jesus, Yeshua, looked at the temple where his name was and said, destroy it, boy, was he misusing the name of the Lord God. That's why the Jews conspired to kill him. And later Jesus died because of that. But Jesus or Yeshua, he came and he revealed the Father's name because he said in John 17, 11, quickly, let's go there too. We're looking at a lot of passages. John 17, verse 11. If you can read from the middle of the verse there, Holy Father, John 17, 11. Holy Father, protect them by the power of your name, the name you gave me, so that day may be one as we are one. So here is Yeshua praying, the chapter, you know, that chapter 17 is his prayer, and he is saying, Father, protect them by the power of your name. He's talking about his disciples. He says, protect them, Father. Protect them by the power of your name. Your name, the name you gave me. So which name is that? The name that he had was Yeshua. And the angel said to Mary to give him the name Yeshua. So people agree that okay so he was named Yeshua but according to Yeshua himself he said it is the name that the father God gave him which is the father's name do you understand it's a simple logic right so what is the father's name what is the father's name the father's name is not Yo Jehovah and the son's name is Yeshua. So many Christians to this day, even preachers and theologians, so confused about what the name of God is. So they say, we'll pray in the name of your son. 
Then what is the name of the Father? I don't know. Maybe it's Jehovah. And then it's the, so then when you baptize in the name of the Father, of the Son, of the Holy Spirit, what do you name, what do you baptize a person in? The name of Jehovah and the name of Yeshua. And then, sorry, Holy Spirit, I don't have any information on you. I don't know what your name is, but, you know, we'll together. But we find out the name that in which we baptize is the name Yeshua because it is the name that the Father gave him. It is the Father's name. Amen. And in Acts 4, 12, it says, Salvation is found in no one else, but there is no other name under heaven given to mankind by which we have been saved. Which name is that? The name Yeshua. So Yeshua revealed that the Father's name is Yeshua and that it is the name to call upon to be saved. This did not sit right with the Jews. This was blasphemous. Not only was Yeshua a man, a mere man in the eyes of others, saying that he was God or the Son of God, but he was also saying his name, the name he came in, was the Father's name, that it was God's name. So this was unacceptable to the Jews. On top of that, what else did he do in his name? What else did he do in his name? He drove out demons from the sick in his name. So he was doing something that no one has ever seen before. So we see in Mar uh, Matthew 9 also that he is driving out demons in his name. In the Old Testament, prophets also perform miracles. And there were others who performed miracles like raising the dead, you know, healing the sick. But nobody ever drove out what's called demons or unclean spirits. It was Yeshua for the first time revealing the existence of these spiritual beings called unclean spirits or demons. And he used his name to drive them out because we see the disciples coming and, and Jesus giving his name, Yeshua giving his name. And I give you my name to go and drive them out. So they, the disciples, when Yeshua was alive, went out without Yeshua and drove out demons in the name. And they left because there was the power in that name, for that name is the name of God. Amen. Nobody ever performed such miracle in the name of Jehovah. You never find in the Old Testament anyone driving out demons in the name Jehovah. But for the first time in the name Yeshua, demons fled. Demons, like the song we sang, demons, every spirit of hell, they trembled at, the, at hearing the name of Yeshua. Hallelujah. However, no one welcomed his name at the time. No one received his name. No one called upon his name. In the end, they all betrayed him. And Yeshua went to the cross. Even though he is the incarnate word, God who came as man, he became weak and, and silent as he went to the cross. But when he died on the cross, what did he say? He said, it is finished. John 19, 30, he declared, it is finished. Because the moment he died was the moment he fulfilled the will of the Father. As we read in Philippians 2, 6 to 8. Christ who being in very nature God. Very nature God. Remember, who is God? Do you remember? Boy, boy, 20 minutes ago, it seemed like long gone history. God is holy. His nature is holy. Holy. So where it says, Christ being in very nature God, he is the holy God. Yeshua, even though he was born of a woman and lived a, li a life like ours for a while, he grew up as a baby, he walked like us, and he ate like us, he slept like us. And finally he was, he was flogged, punched, nailed, and crucified, and killed. Like, just like any man. But what the Bible tells us is that he is the very nature God who is holy. Yet, he did not consider equality with God something to be grasped. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking a very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness. And by being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself, not just with lips, and say, Father, I lift you up. I humble myself. He didn't give lip service. What did he do? He showed in his body to honor and lift up the name of the Father. So what he did was he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death. In John 10, 17 and 18, Jesus said, this 
I received command from the Father, it was to lay down my life willingly. And I do it willingly with the authority that he has given me. So it was the moment that the son willingly laid down his life in obedience to the Father's command. And by doing so, he glorified the Father. Amen? Now remember, I think I touched on that last week too. We sing songs and we say glorify you, we glorify God. But we don't glorify God. We can't. Why not? Because God's glory is too great. He doesn't receive glory from sinners like us, creatures like us. He's not magnified by that. He is only glorified. He's on, his name is only lifted up by the Holy One. Who is the Holy One of God? It is the Son, Yeshua. Hallelujah. So when, even though he is the very nature God, he died like a sinner, like he was unholy, like one of us. But he did it willingly laying down his life. And when he did so, when the greatest one humbles himself, the only one remaining above is the Father God. Do you understand? Because Yeshua is the Holy One. He is the glorious one. When he lay down his glory, lay down his holiness, lay down himself, not like God. He, even, he gave up being like God and being treated as God. He laid on himself like a humble man, a servant, a sinner, to the point of death. The one who was magnified was the Father for his name to be lifted up. The Son died. Hallelujah. And by doing so, he condemned the devil, the archangel, who tried to attempt, who attempted to lift himself up. Lift himself up. Remember, I told you the human nature is to lift ourselves up. Yeah, everybody does that. You know that. Always boasting and, and bragging, even in the quote unquote hum, humble way. Humble way. You know, even humble ways, people boast themselves. Oh, I don't know any. I'm not so good. You know, they say things like that, but this is because they want to say I'm humble. But in that sort of appearing, appearing hum humility, they're boasting. I'm not like you guys boasting. I'm humble. <laughs> you understand? Are you following me? So it's a human nature, but this is all because of the devil who tried to become like God when he is not. But Jesus, who is the very nature of God, by laying down his life and showing this is how you lift him up. This is how you glorify his name, by becoming nothing. Literally becoming nothing. And he condemned, therefore, the enemy. And by tearing his flesh and pouring out his blood, Yeshua made a way for sinners like you and me to come to God to know him, and to also have the name of God, the name Yeshua. Hallelujah. So Hebrews 10, 19, 20, it says, Therefore, brothers and sisters, since we have confidence to enter the most holy place, who is in the most holy place? It is God. It is the father of our souls. It is Yeshua. By his blood, we have gained the confidence by a new and living way, open for us through the curtain, through his body. Hallelujah. So we come and meet with God through Yeshua. We don't meet with God directly. We can't. But we meet with Yeshua. We praise the name Yeshua. And we can have his name Yeshua because Yeshua, his flesh was torn and his blood was spilled out to redeem our sins and give us life. Hallelujah. Then what happened? Then what happened? Day one goes by. Day two goes by. And what happens on the, on the third day after his death? Yeshua was risen. Who raised him? Was there a timer? A timer or alarm clock? Yeshua said, okay, this time I die. And then I set it up, my phone. Three days. And then, zzz, zzz, time to get up. That's not how it happened. Who raised him up? The Father raised him up. So go back to Philippians 2, 9. Chapter 2, verse 9. Therefore, God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth. And every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God, the father. Hallelujah. So the father is the one who raised the son up from the grave. 
He raised them up from the tomb. He was exalted to the highest place by the Father. Jesus rose from the grave. And some days later, he ascended to heaven, which I talked about during the, during the resurrection day service and last week about Jesus coming back to, to heaven. He was taken up. So where is Jesus right now? He is seated on the throne. Where is that throne? In heaven, in the spiritual heaven. So the throne is in the spiritual heaven and he is seated there. What is he doing on the throne? Huh? What is he doing? Who sits on the throne? Come on. Think. Who sits? King. King sits on the throne. So what does he receive? He receives glory. He is lifted up. The one who is seated on the throne receives the service of those who are standing. You know, that's why we stand up when we worship, right? Yeah. We stand up because the only one who's seated is the king. And he is Yeshua. So he is the Lamb of God and he's seated on the throne as the king of all, receiving all honor, all glory, all praise, all blessings. By whom? By whom? By all the angels filling up, the, up heaven, but all those who believe, confess that he is Lord and who come on their knees to worship him, to lift his name up. Hallelujah. But when that happens, who receives the glory through the son? It is the father. This is the will of God. This is the will of God to receive glory for himself. He sent his son to do this great work of destroying the enemy and saving men so that by that men will know him, call upon his name to be saved. And when they confess he is Lord and they lift him his name, lift up his name, then Yeshua, the son receives glory. And through receiving that glory, the father is glorified. Hallelujah. But how do we know that? Because the Holy Spirit came to those who call upon his name. Say amen. If you have believed in the name Yeshua. Amen. Are you not sure still? Say amen once again. If you called upon his name. Amen. amen. Why did you call upon his name? To be saved. John 1.12 says, Whosoever believes in his name will receive the right to become the children of God. So when you receive the name Yeshua, you call him father abba father once again say amen if you have received his name amen. then to such souls the holy spirit comes so in acts chapter 2 after jesus ascended he as he was ascending he said to the disciples do not leave jerusalem stay here and receive the counselor the holy spirit i will send him to you you remain in jerusalem and the believers gather together hundreds of them in the beginning, and then they were praying, but eventually it dwindled down to 120. On the day 10, the Holy Spirit came upon that gathering in the name of Yeshua, and suddenly these people were praying in tongues, new tongues, new language that nobody understood. And they knew that the gift that Yeshua had promised them had come. And what was the result of that? They didn't remain inside the room, praying, 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 praying by themselves. What did they do? They poured out to the streets and they went out and they sent one message, which was, you killed Jesus, but God raised him to life. And we are witnesses of this fact. Hallelujah. And we are here to preach the name Yeshua. Hallelujah. They did not go out and started preaching you Jehovah. They started testifying and preaching about the name Yeshua. So you, know, you read Acts in the beginning, you know, just throughout the whole book, but especially in the beginning, it's so exciting because it's a, in the beginning, it's a story of Peter and then continues to Paul. But Peter, who had been a, a disciple of Jesus, and he's then labeled as a coward once he dis disowns Jesus three times. But then something happens as a result of the Holy Spirit coming He's completely turned around, completely changed to now boldly testify about Yeshua. So a after they receive the Holy Spirit in Acts chapter 2, they pray in tongues. And Paul is pre preaching, uh, Peter is preaching to the Jews, fellow Jews, and saying, 
You need. You are the ones who killed Jesus, but God raised him. And the Jews who heard him were so terrified. They said, what, "What? Oh my God! We killed God. We killed the Son of God. What should we do?" And then Peter said boldly, "Repent, every one of you, and be baptized in the name of Yeshua for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit." And then there were thousands of people who converted, 5,000, and another time 3,000, 3,000, and then 5,000 later. So they were converted to become followers of the name Yeshua. Then what happens is that they continue to preach. In chapter 3, we read about Peter and John. They were good friends. You know, a lot of scholars say they were good friends. Uh, so they always traveled together uh, in the beginning anyway until they were arrested and they went to different places. But Peter and John, they go together to the temple uh, in Acts chapter 3. And they come across a man who was lame from birth. And he's begging. He's, you know, he, people bring him to the gate to beg for money. And then they, they bring him back home, I guess, and then bring him back again. So every day he was brought here to beg because he's lame. Can't do anything. And then Peter and John walk by him. They're, they're filled with the Holy Spirit. They have boldness by the power of the name Yeshua. They've been preaching boldly. And then they, they see this sick man. And we see for the first time the miracle being performed in the name Yeshua. So Peter says, look at us. And then the lame man looked at them. Maybe this guy has a million bucks. Maybe he has a ticket to miraculous surgery. So he looked at him. Look at us. I love that. There's like an exclamation mark. Look at us, Peter said. And then he, he looked at them. And what does Peter say? Silver and gold I do not have. But what I have in the name of Jesus, in the name of Yeshua, get up and walk. First time he's listening to this. What? You, know, you mean you don't have money for me or spare change? But then he listens. He goes, he has something that I've always wanted all my life. More than money is to get up. More than money, what I need is to walk. Because if I walk, I can work and I can have money. But I've never walked in my life. But here's a man looking so bold. Something about him and something about the name Yeshua. May the lame man get up with all his strength. And gain strength in his legs. Perhaps his legs were shaking and he couldn't even take a step. For the first time ever, he started walking. He got up and he walked. And he joined them to the temple. And he praised God. He praised the name Yeshua. Do you believe that? Yes. Remember Zen? Are you with me? Yeah, you remember those days. Yahweh. No, the name. Yeshua. Hallelujah. We did a wonderful play on that two, a couple years ago. So he, they performed that miracle. And what happens after that is that the Jews call Peter and John to them and say, okay, tell us what happened to this man. What, what are you guys doing? So they question him and then they start to testify. And they noticed they were, the Jews were a because Peter said, you know, those words, salvation in Acts 4. Salvation is found in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given to mankind by which we must be saved. And then they saw the courage of Peter and John and realized, these guys are just fishermen. They were just fishing a couple years ago, never went to school. They were unschooled, ordinary men. That's why the Jews were astonished. And they took note that these men had been with Jesus. So they were shocked because these men were fishermen. They were not scholars. They were not, uh, they were not sp public speakers. But suddenly they were bold and they were preaching and performing miracles. And the Jews were shocked. But they also realized that if Peter and John and all the other apostles continue to do what they were doing, that this whole city will be turned upside down. And their faith, Judaism, the Jewish faith in the name of the Jewish the, the God of the Jewish people, Jehovah, will be threatened. So they said to them, in verse 17, Stop this thing from spreading any further among the people. We must warn them to speak no longer to anyone in this name. So we see that from Acts 4 and, and on. The effort of the, Jew, the Jews who persecuted the Christians, the disciples, the apostles, was to stop them from speaking this name. Which name? The name? Yeshua. So they said to them, they called them and said, commanded them not to speak, to teach 
at all in the name of Jesus. But Peter and John replied, which is right in God's eyes, to listen to you or listen to him. You be the judges. As for us, we cannot stop speaking about what we have seen and heard. Hallelujah. And in Acts 5, because they continue to do so, they bring him back again. And then they want to kill him, but then there's another Pharisee saying, well, let's not kill him. Because, you know, if this name is like fabricated, it's a fake name, they will disappear. But if this name is real, and it's the name of God, and, and the Yeshua, this man is really God, then that truth will be revealed too. So the other Jews listened to that Pharisee. And what they did was they ordered Peter and John to be flogged. I don't know how many times, but they were flogged. They were beaten. They were flogged, whipped. But this is the heartbreaking part. Verse 41, chapter 5, it says, They went rejoicing because they had been counted worthy of suffering disgrace for the name. They went home rejoicing, even in their flogged, bloody bodies. They rejoiced because they were counted worthy of suffering disgrace for the name Yeshua and later on in Acts chapter 7 we read about a young man named Stephen who was also bold in preaching about Yeshua and because of that the Jews just couldn't hear anymore and they said enough and they pulled him out dragged him out of the city and they stoned him to death and the stoning people had thrown their jackets so that they could just put all their effort to stone this young man to death their jackets went to the feet of another young man named Saul. Saul was the persecutor of the Christians, the church at the time. He witnessed the death of Stephen. And on his way, after he went to the priest and said, give me the permission to arrest Christians, and he was on his way to Damascus to arrest more Christians, what happened? He hears the voice of the Lord saying, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? And his soul is stopping this track and he says, who are you, Lord? And then the voice said, I am Jesus. I am Yeshua. You are persecuting me. And he fell. The other people who were around him also heard the noise, but they didn't know what it was about. And what happened as a result was when Saul opened his eyes, he couldn't see anything. And he was instructed to go and, and stay uh, for three days with, um, uh, for waiting for this man, Ananias. Ananias was a Christian. And, the, and God spoke to him and said, go and look for this man named Saul. And Ananias said, this man has been persecuting us, persecuting Christians. How can we trust him? Then Jesus said to him, go. This man is cho my chosen instrument to carry my name to carry my name before the Gentiles and their kings and before the people of Israel, to carry my name. I have chosen Saul, who later becomes Paul. What we see is that as a result of receiving the Holy Spirit, mind you, those of us who receive the Holy Spirit, it's the same Holy Spirit. These men, after they received the Holy Spirit, they became crazy for Jesus. They became what's called Jesus freaks. They became unstoppable in their effort to lift up the name Yeshua, to worship the name Yeshua, to preach the name Yeshua, to use the name Yeshua. They became unstoppable. So the Christian, a man made by the Holy Spirit, is not this classy, elegant person who goes to church quietly and then comes home and does good to others in the worldly sense. But the man of the Holy Spirit is someone like Peter, John, Stephen, Paul, to become unstoppable, become like freaks for the name Yeshua. So when we worship the name Yeshua on the Lord's Day, as we begin our week on the Holy Day, on the Lord's Day, on Sunday, not at home, not on vacation, not somewhere else, but on the, on the Lord's Day, we gather in his name. As he said, where two or three are gathered in my name, there I will be. So two or three are gathered as members of the body of Christ into the church. We worship him. And when we worship him, 
We worship with all our hearts to meet and seek the face of Yeshua. We don't see him in reality. But in faith, as we worship in spirit and in truth, we have to run into the house of God, the house in the name Yeshua, to, to, to meet with him with such longing and love. Not to show up. Oh, here we go again. I need to just get through 10 to 12 and then eat bagel and peel out of the parking lot to do that laundry. Oh, well, I couldn't go. I didn't feel like it. So what? That's not somebody who knows the name Yeshua. Even if you are seated in here, however, if you sit there with no hope, no longing, no love for the name Yeshua, you will also have wasted your time. Better than not coming. But still, that worship has not been received. Whose worship does he receive? He receives the worship that is worthy of the great and holy name, Yeshua. So that means we have to live our week in prayer, in the effort of making this worship successful. For me to meet with him, I need to pray, I need to work, I need to preach, I need to serve, so that on the Lord, when I come and call on his name, Yeshua, forgive my sins, he actually listens and forgives my sins and receives my offerings, my worship, my praise, and my prayer. So praise. When we praise, I know people who come into church for the first time, who come into like a lively church like this, like, oh, I have to get used to it. Yes, I know people think the church should be quiet, right? Because this is how people think of church. Christians, very quiet because holy means being quiet. But whoever said that? Whoever said that? King David, who, who, who celebrate the coming, the return of the ark, he was dancing so crazy that his wife was so embarrassed. Remember, this was time before, pre-underwear time, Yeah. And they used to wear slit tunics. So he was dancing with his legs, bouncing up and down. And the, the wife looking at him from the above, and the, from above, you know, floor above, and saying, I can't believe you did that in front of the maidservants and the manservants and all the people around. And you call yourself king of Israel. And David said, how can I refrain? How can I refrain myself from giving and celebrating the name, the return of the name of the Lord God in that ark? Remember, men were killed when they mishandled the ark. Usa, Ratsa, he, was, he, was, he prevented the, the ark from tipping because the oxen was like moving and he tried to keep it from tilting. And because he touched it without permission, he was killed right there. Because the name of, which name is that? The name, not Yeshua, the name Jehovah. And who delivered that name? The angel of the Lord. Even so, anyone mishandling, anyone not praising was cursed. So what happened to King David's wife who criticized his, his, her husband for praising such way? She was barren until the day she died. Remember that in the Hebrew context is the worst curse a woman can ever face, being childless. So us today, if we know the name Yeshua, which the Son of God himself came in and gave us, and to give us, he was torn and spilled out. How can we refrain from praising him with all my heart and all my soul? Amen. Amen. So this is why I put so much effort in the worship team. You, you determine the fate of our worship. That's what I say. But if people are standing up here and thinking about their problems, I'm not, whatever, there's all distraction on their face. Man, the whole worship is affected as well. Yeah, for that, we have to pray. For the success of worship, the worship leader has to pray and live life, putting effort. I'm not saying perfect life, but live life that is in effort to make the worship successfully. And when the leaders go up, you know, the, so the worship team, myself, all of us, we're like the priests going ahead. Priests are blowing the trumpet and they're sim playing the cymbals and lyre and praising God and the rest of the people coming and following to worship him. So we are the ones who are making that that fanfare, we're opening up. But without preparing, how is that worship? How is that praise? How is that praise? Please, how is it pleasing the Lord? How is it lifting up his name? Think about that. Do you know, do you know the holiness of his name? That his name is above all names. 
The reason why we need to pray, Jesus himself said, pray in my name. In John 14, 13 to 14, I will do whatever you ask in my name so that the Father may be glorified in the Son. You may ask me for anything in my name and I will do it. In my name, ask for it. Don't ask for vain things, but ask to glorify him. Ask to glorify him. Because when you answer prayer after, after praying in his name, you know it was only him who answered your prayer. So when you open up your mouth, you're going to say, God, answer my prayer. Yeshua, answer my prayer. We give him glory. And then the son then glorifies the father. Why do we need to go preach? Preaching is to bring one more soul on his knees and open up his mouth to confess that Jesus is Lord. Amen? To bring a soul, what do we do, however? We don't, we don't bring them like, you know, captors, bringing captives, and you sit down. That's not what we do. Can you please come? I'll meet you at Starbucks. What are you, are you hungry? I have donuts. Serena's like, here's donut. You want donut? <laughs> are you hungry? You're gonna, go, yeah, you're here. You want more? Here, here, here. Okay, okay, I'll wait for you. You need me to pick you up? I'll wait. You're doing your hair for 15 minutes? I'll wait. I'm going to be late for service, but I'll wait for 20 minutes too. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So they are like servants, you know, almost like servants. Whatever, whatever you want, whatever you want. Because our heart is to see one more soul coming to Christ on their knees, even though we're not bringing them to their enemy by force. When they come to know him and his, the magnificent name of Yeshua, they will be helpless. They couldn't help but to bring themselves on their knees and confess, Yeshua, you alone are Lord. Hallelujah. To see that, we go out and preach to souls. Whoever we meet, we try to be nice to them. We want to be inviting to them. We want to and buy their hearts. So that they may also know the greatness, the holiness of his name. Amen. We also need to work in his name. Driving out demons to heal. Some people say, well, you, in this church, you don't, you don't let me go to and take medication and go to hospital. What is wrong with this church? Ask Jesus about that. Not me. Mark 16, Jesus said, in my name, they will drive out demons. In my name, they will lay their hands on the sick, and the sick will be healed. Hallelujah. Which name is that? The name? Yeshua. We still have the same name, the same power, same authority. So why don't we use it to bring him glory? Hallelujah. Pray, preach, praise in his name. And finally, when he comes back, he will take back those whose lives have been dedicated and thrown away for his name. Thrown away. Because in Revelation 22, 3 to 4 says about the holy city in heaven, no longer will there be any curse. The throne of God and of the Lamb will be in the city, and his servants will serve him. They will see his face, and his name will be on their foreheads. His name will be on their foreheads. When the world sees us, what do they see in our foreheads? When our coworkers see us, what do they see on our foreheads? Zealous workers to climb the ladder, to get more money, more recognition. When our neighbors see us, what do they see on our foreheads? Living for our family, for our own fame. Our desire is to be seen with the name Yeshua written on our foreheads today. While I'm alive, my words, my action, my life should reveal the name Yeshua. And for that sake, if I suffer, I would rejoice. For it, I have been counted worthy of suffering disgrace for the sake of his name. And then... He will not leave us behind. Hallelujah. Let's pray. Please close your eyes and reflect the message. The name Yeshua, the name Jesus, was a name, was the name of a man who lived but for about 33 years and died on the cross like an animal, like a criminal. But he was not just a man. He is God, the very nature God, who was with the Father God in the beginning, without sin, 
the Holy One of God. That's why he was risen from the grave in three days, ascended to heaven, and sent us the counselor, the Holy Spirit, so that the name Yeshua may be spread around the world and be heard. By the grace of God, I have heard this name. I want to now live my life, throwing my life away for this name. Because he threw away his life for the Father's name. I want to throw away my life for the name Yeshua. Because in that day, I want his name to be on my forehead. Let's lift up our hands to the name Yeshua. And call on his name, Yeshua. Yeshua. Yeshua! Yeshua! For the name Yeshua to be above every name, for it to be outstanding. My worship, my praise of his name has to be outstanding. My prayer, my preaching effort, my works in his name to drive out demons and heal. All the things that I do in his name must be outstanding. Help me, Holy Spirit. Help me, Lord. Let me go out and be crazy for you in the way I worship and pray and preach. Let's pray, Yeshua. He came to us a man, very nature God, fierce for our iniquities as he hung upon the cross. God exalted you to the highest place and gave the right to bear the name above all names. And at the name of Jesus we shall bow And every tongue confess you are Lord And when you come in glory for the world to see We will see When the glory of the risen Lord will run upon the earth, the rival thrones will fall before the Lord of all, and hell supreme authority to the living God. And at the name of Jesus we shall bow, and every tongue confess. You are Lord, and when you come in glory for the world to see, we will see. Hallelujah! Hail to the King in all His splendor and majesty. Hail Pray for each other. Join hands with those next to you. If you have never heard about the name Yeshua, but now you desire to honor his name, to lift up his name in all the ways you can, you pray for that. Those of us, however, who have heard many times, 
Therefore, we're convicted in our hearts that we still do not live the right life, lifting him up, his name up. We repent and put behind what is behind. And we resolve to live this day and the coming week and the coming future until he comes to lift up his name. So let us pray in encouragement of one another to face shame and persecution in putting effort to lift up his name that we would not be afraid we would not be ashamed of his name but we would encourage one another to go out and proclaim his name so that in that day when he comes in glory that we will be found with his name written on our foreheads to serve him face to face forever pray for each other Yeshua to the king hail to the king in holy splendor and majesty hail to the king of kings Lord Jesus our God give him praise Worship him. Praise his name. Lift up his name, Yeshua. <laughs> 